What is up, everybody? Logan here again with another video. Today, I'm joined by Halcyon Trader again, and today we're going to look at the market again for you guys, just like we did last week. Now, something I want to touch on a little bit, too, is I've been taking this market a little bit slower than normal. Usually, I get like 20 contracts when I grab a trade, whether it's a 4 DTE, uh, some 0 DTEs, you know, 15, 20, sometimes 25 contracts. But lately, I've only been trading like two to three contracts just because it's volatility. And I know it's a good time when there's high volatility to be an option seller. Um, but we have some world events going on, too, that are causing a lot of irrational moves overnight. So it's very hard to swing trade this market. Um, but I'm joined by Halcyon today, and we're going to take a look at the market in general. I appreciate you coming on today, my man. Yeah, all good. Appreciate the five hundred dollars. Come on, thank you. Nice <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, challenging environment, no doubt. Uh, you know that's that has been the case for I would say really since mid November. We've had we came off that really nice run, you know, from basically mid October till around mid Novemberish time frame. And then it has been chop central since that period of time. So those that were looking for more swing setups, um, you know, and, and getting long, which is what this market has been for months and months and months, was just be long. You know, we zoom out, look at that, just upward, onward, upward. Now all this mess that we've been dealing with lately. Um, you know, I think that's yeah. When you're seeing this kind of stuff going on, you got to make sure you're aware. A, be aware that this is what's up. And then B, uh, make sure that your strategies and what you're doing uh, are accommodative to what the market is giving you. Because again, your, your job always as a trader is to make money, not be right. And, uh, you know, when we get into this kind of stuff, we get into a very volatile time frame, especially coming off the heels of really two years straight of almost complete upward rocket markets. You know, that's gives you this kind of false sense of, um, you can just keep doing the same thing over and over again and it'll keep working. And that's one of the most interesting and frustrating things about the market in general is that it's forever changing. It is never the same thing, the same environment always. It just, that just isn't the case. Uh, you know, so I think a lot of folks who were perma long and perma bullish strategies have been really struggling since probably November, in my guess, um, in adapting to that environment. It's pretty that's key to be long-term trading. Again, you have your setups and you have your setups for certain environments that you look for. You have your setups for, you know, volatile environments. You have your setups for bullish trending environments. You have your setups for bearish environments. And, you know, paying attention to where you are in those cycles you know, greatly increase your ability to manage through them. I like to say during times like this, the goal is just is to aim small and miss small here. You know, because there it's, with volatility that's moving all over the place like this, really price that's moving all over the place like this, um, you know, you just, you want to get out of this without getting beat up too bad. That's, that's the way I view this things like just, just hang through it, you know, stay smaller or like you're doing, you know, you manage size, size down a bit, especially if you do not have great setups. And that I would say there has been decent setups to the downside, but there's not been a lot of good long setups uh, here, especially since about mid November. And you know, maybe with a rare couple of stock exceptions like energy uh, and a little bit financials, but aside from those two areas, there really hasn't been a whole lot of things that have set up to be to look good. And you know, the worst thing you do is try to force trades when they aren't actually there. And every person who's traded or invested, you you know, you know you have that like little monkey on your back, that you know, little dark side trading version of yourself that is just got to be in a trade, regardless if the setup is perfect or not. You just have that feeling like, you know, if I'm not in something, I'm missing out on something. I just got to be in it, uh, you know, and, and learning to master that and ignore that, uh, you know, it's probably one of the key things to be long term. Well, it is one of the main key areas to be to be a long term trader in general. So you got to be able to master that, uh, not let that, you know, override you. So quick thought, let's just kind of walk through our, you know, our opinions of where we are with things right now. Uh, historically. I would say historically in the context of in the last two years, what we would have normally expected from this market and then what we are actually seeing from this market. Um, and so 
you know, I'll give you my thoughts. Logan, I'm definitely curious to hear your thoughts on this too. So for me, you know, we look at, um, here's the one hours on the left here. It's a 90 day, one hour. And on the right, I've got daily, a two year daily. And his, what we've seen happen the last two years in this incredible bull run out of the pandemic lows is when those little pullbacks happen, we just tend to rip out of there, you know, like, like a rocket. And, you know, you'd have things like this taking place. You get down here and then it just rockets out. What for, for this is definitely a characteristic change to me where we have continued to make lower highs and we're attempting at the moment here to make a lower low. Uh, you know, rush, this Russian news that's going on is not really helping anything uh, other than trying to push the market lower here. But this to me is, is a, you know, this is a heads up. I mean, there, there is some, the characteristic is changing. We've been seeing that happening under the surface for a little while now, but it's starting to show up in price at this point. Uh, it, it just, and it, for me, you know, what needs to happen here is that if we're really going to you know, get out of this area and start off to, you know, go attack the highs again, there's a lot of work that needs to be put in before that takes place. We got to build a foundation to launch off of. Now this could be, maybe this whole section here is just building a giant base of which is going to shoot up here again, you know, fly back up into this range back up to the mean, you know, 4,900 range. But the way this looks, I mean, if I had to take a guess, looking at our indicators, I mean, everything's kind of pointing down. I don't have a lot of stuff that is, you know, looking like it wants to be bullish and flying up. To me, it looks like we're going to you know, we're gonna push below and take out this low here. We're really, really close to doing it. Uh, you know, I would not be surprised if we end up doing that and push into the 4,200, 4,250 range. Uh, before it kind of figures out whether or not it's going to, you know, on, on, honestly be a bear market, full bear market, or just going to be a correction or on to the next, you know, setups here. Because in general, um, when we do see these things start to get volatile like this and, and start making lower highs, obviously that's one of the main ingredients of what we're looking for real corrections. Um, market is certainly fight. It is fighting to not get pushed down. I'm, I'm honestly surprised we are way down this morning based on the news from last night. Um, in fact, I was doing my usual woke up and took a look at like two in the morning, what the futures were doing and what the headlines were. And it was, you know, futures crash. And like, really? Is this just some sensationalized version of this? Yeah. And, and I think they were at one point, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're down about 2% at one point in the middle of the night. Yeah. So it says something that it pushed back out of that. You know, it's starting to, roll a little bit right now push down a little bit after this morning but you know it does it just doesn't look it, this isn't the same environment that we were in in the middle of 2020 or in the middle of 2021 just you got to be aware like if something has changed here internally the exact what i really don't care like what news they're going to attribute it to you know at some point right that doesn't help us with anything but knowing the why that is it's not going to really help us at this immediate moment because the why always comes out like three to six months after the fact so spending your time and energy trying to figure out what that reason is, I don't, I don't, I don't really care, nor do I want to spend my time doing that. But I will follow the price action. And certainly price action is, you know, it's not been bullish. It's been very volatile. So curious from you, Logan, if you look at, if you're kind of looking through things here, what's your, you know, general take on this? I know you mentioned you're sizing a little smaller at this point just to stay a little more nimble. But, you know, when you look at the market, how do you interpret this based on what you've experienced in the last two years so far? Yeah, so definitely, definitely very different from the last two years. Um, I would say this looks more like 2018, if I'm gonna compare it to anything I've seen in the last four years, where it's just like this slow drift down. And back then we had a, the government shutdown looming, where it was like every week we had no idea, right? That was kind of the thesis back for late 2018. And we had a couple stocks missing earnings that were very important. Um, the, the one thing that has me really curious, and I, I probably talked about this in another video, but we've had super strong earnings for a lot of the big tech stocks like Apple and Google, right? And a lot of those stocks that continue to show like, hey, the market should continue to go up. We're looking good. Our forecasts are really good for those stocks. But then you have stocks like Facebook, well, Meta now, and a lot of other stocks like Roku, where their outlook and on these four tech stocks that have really held up the market for quite some time, um, really haven't improved, right? So 
they've just been getting shut down. So we're, we've been dealing with this mixed market for about, like you said, it's been about three months at least um, for it could even, you could even argue from September when we started to see the advanced decline go down. Now I'm a little contrarian and I always have been when it comes to like how I take my trades. Um, so I'm still right now, I'm cautiously bullish. So I don't have anything as far as like I'm long on positions, but I have put credit spreads open. So I have runway, I have run room on the S and P 500. So I'm just cautious, cautiously bullish because my whole thesis still is like we're in the buy zone on a lot of the time frames, and even looking at the two year one, like the one day, like the daily, basically, we're coming down to that standard deviation, like one standard deviation away from the mean to the downside. And that's generally a good low risk, high reward spot, even though we are below the moving averages still. Um, I still like that as far as like, if you're going to be contrarian, this is the time to do it. Regardless of what the news says, because for me, just trading in this market has become super difficult because we have, like you said last night, we were down 2%. It's like, let's say you're shorting this market and you wake up, you're like, oh, sweet, 2%. Can't wait to wake up to a bunch of profit. And then you wake up and the market's literally green. And right now it's down, you know, 0.3%. But, um, you know, it was green for a second this morning. So, that's something that I've been kind of keeping my eye on is I don't like to short the market after it's fallen for, you know, after we've gone through a correction, it can definitely go deeper, but I'm just always kind of cautiously, cautiously bullish, just kind of like when we were up at 4,800 and when we were up at the, that last October run, you know, in early November, when we got to the top of that TTM squeeze on the two year um, beginning of November right when it started to calm down there. That's where I started to take a more bearish take. And we really didn't even fall. Like that whole time I was a bear, um, but we did not fall until we got the Omnicron news. That was just a couple of weeks after. So pretty much right around then, I've just always been contrarian. Like if I get too far up, you know, I'm going to start with some call credits. And then if we get as far down as we've been, like I'm cautiously placing put credits because the VIX is so high you can get really good premium down low, but you also have to be careful because like your expected moves can be 80 points in one day. So, and the VIX is getting close to the top end of the channel, even though it's in the full bull pattern right now and the momentum's going up and everything, the RSI is green. I'm, I've always just been contrarian that way where, you know, we're eventually going to revert to the mean. So I'd much rather be, uh, be on that side, you know, whenever the VIX is at the lower part of the channel, expect it to pop soon. And then especially when we're up towards the nosebleeds, pretty much. Um, this is where I kind of look to not be as long anymore. So that's kind of my take on it right now is I'm just cautiously bullish here for those reasons. I like it. <clears throat> I mean, that's, again, you gotta, you gotta take an approach where you always got to keep your perspective. Right? I mean, you can't, you, what we tend to do sometimes get so zoomed in that we miss the perspective of what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think when we look at like, for example, the NASDAQ, that's a lot weaker of an index than what's going on with the S&P. Um, you know, we look at the Russell, same kind of thing. We had a long base that was built for months and months and months. This has been one of the weaker indexes for almost, I think since June of last year. Yeah. And it broke down and it, I mean, to me, it sure looks like it's, it's ready to make another leg down, yeah. you know, uh, which because the Russell is mostly small cap, you can see it move into its a, a standard deviation lines that are lower than normal. Most times the big indexes, they rarely ever push below one on the standard deviation channels. I mean, it's not, it's very uncommon, but the smaller the stocks or the more focused the positions like sector size, uh, you can see those go up and down to the, the full standard deviation lines that are one, one and a half, two away. So, you know, it's if we're looking what we're strength in the market right now, if you're, you know, if you were doing things that weren't just S and P options, um, you know, I think your your best bet is you focus on what's working currently. So, like energy, energy, right? And gold. Uh, I mean, look how different energy looks. And this is, by the way, a beautiful setup that's right here. That was a hell of a setup. I was broke out of this little flag and squeezing and everything was point positive, changing over volume was coming in and boom, nice run. Uh, XME, which is the gold mining 
um, side. You know, again, it's kind of similar thing, but it's you can see that it's just it's that is where the strength is in the market. GLD currently as well. I've been actually on this one for quite some time. It just it moves so slow at 0.78% on average, which is just that's not fast enough for for most Austria. Then you just want boring. That's a good that's a good place to do that. Um, <laughs> Because that's going to just slowly eat away premium all day. Yep. Uh, this is also IXC. What are you? Global energy. Okay. This is energy and equipment. This is transports. You know, still kind of downtrending ish. Our banks, regional, and um, the big banks. So, financials, again, because we're in obviously just some fundamental stuff, is we're in an environment that has. Um, you know, inflation's here or not here, who knows? Depends on what, you know, Powell is saying one day or another. But yeah. banks tend to do pretty decent inside of that. Um, you know, so that's an area to have some exposure to. Interestingly enough, like, you know, I rank these by just RSI, where they are on the daily RSI. Um, you know, so the number one position is, is mining. I'd say number two is going to be like right behind it with gold and uh, energy. But then at the bottom of the list is, we're looking at like biotech. I mean, look how ugly that trend is. That killed. You know, again, contrarian, like you were saying earlier, we've gone from one end of deviation all the way down to the lower two and a half move, which to me, this would be on my short list of waiting to see this thing base for a couple of weeks and to see if it can finally come out of the base bigger because there are going to be some amazing opportunities uh, for long plays on biotech. Once it gets out of this correction phase, um, you know, again, just looking contrarian on this cloud computing as well. Good Lord. As soon as they were like, yeah, I'm done with pandemic. <laughs> All the cloud-based stuff just got smacked. Um, you know, so it's, again, this whole area too, when we, when we get through this correction, we're going to have such a steep correction inside of here uh, that it's going to give you opportunities. And like ARC, one of our favorite, you know, our favorite funds here, ARC, yeah. This is down about 80%, right, since its highs. Yep. Um, and that tends to be about as far as they go when, when the former leader makes a correction. Um, and so this is an area that, you know, I'm watching closely to see, can we build a base for a while? And then I'd want to look at getting long once that base process is done. Of course, I'm going to use, you know, is there green volume coming in? Are we having, you know, any kind of actual indicator set up as well? But Really, do we see a, a, pat, a pattern of a price where it stabilizes down here? Because it is just free falling since, I mean, it hit as high of 159. And it's basically been free falling. You know, it's dropped sideways, drop, you know, sideways for a long time, big drop. And it's just been free falling since really it broke that final support here around 115 or so. Um, again, I don't think Kathy would have lost her magic. She's just in a, an area that is a mid cap and small cap growth, you know space and those are the two that's probably the weakest markets across the board is is small and mid cap growth i mean even in the large cap even the large growth companies are way lagging behind their value counterparts so you know i mean i think as we look at this kind of uh, you know perspective here the perspective is we're very volatile right vix is up we still have lots of room for the vix to keep moving up right here's our last couple of times we went up to 38 we're sitting here around 29 per so this, you know, so the saying this is peaking out and done, that's, that's, I would not, you know, take this off the board of the VIX is peak. It's time to start going long and everything is going to start dropping. Uh, also in mind, the VIX is not a stock. It's not trading price like a stock. Does. It's trading the differences between the puts and calls on the S&P. And that's, that's what makes up the VIX. So, you know, you can't trade it exactly like it's a stock. Now there's some ways, there's some, obviously some, there's correlations there, but it is not one-to-one -one direct that way. Um, and so I've, you know, I've seen using some of the main indicators, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work with it because again, it's not the same price action as a stock normally does. Um, you know, S&P, uh, moving very slow. Yeah, again, it's, I don't know, man, this, this tells me we got, we got enough, I mean, we got a couple of weeks at least of seeing this try to figure itself out. Mm. If I had to guess right now, I think it's going to break lower and then build its base to come back up. Um, you know, having trade, actually got my trading chops in the 2008 correction. Um, 
which was just an unrelenting kick in the teeth day after day after day after day for like two years. Uh, well, not quite two years, a year and a half, basically. And you'd have these interesting counter trend, trend, counter trend rallies where you pop up usually to the 50 and then drop down a big leg and then have a nice 20% rise up back into the 50 and drop down another leg. And it was just this unrelenting whipsaw. And you know, what was smart at that time was just, it was staying small, you know, picking your, um, your spots and being tight with your stops. You know, and it's, you know, it's, you know, environments like this, they will expose if you have a bad setup that you use or you have poor risk management. One way or another, you get exposed to that at some point. And everyone's a rock star in, upward, in a straight up market, but it's when you get volatility in down markets where your your plan gets exposed and it gets tested to see where the weak points are. And so that's something for your own self to look at. You know, whoever's listening to this is, do you have a risk management plan? What is your actual stops that you're using to control whatever the environment is that you're trading in? Do you even have them? You know, uh, you, how do you how do you manage what your percentage of loss is acceptable? How does that relate to what's overall per position based on your overall portfolio? Like, what are you willing to put at risk per position of the portfolio? And should it be the exact same in this environment as it was, say, in mid-2020? I mean, you know, I think when you're in an upward environment, you're willing to take more risk because the reward is there. When you're in a sideways or down market, that same level of, uh, of bullish idea is it's going to get you crushed. You're going to lose a bunch of money doing that because the environment has changed. So, you know, I think that <laughs> that's one of the best things you can do as you keep honing your skills and keep in mind, this is a skill. I mean, this is a skill and a mindset and an attitude that we work through on this. You know, the attitude being that um, you're going to be an insatiable learner across this process to make sure that you refine what it is that trading and investing means to you and exactly how you're going to do it. Um, you know, and it's a skill in the sense that you spend hours and hours and hours reviewing chart patterns, reviewing and getting your visual, um, IQ of the charts to be extremely sharp with when you see something, you immediately know which way you expect something to go. And that just takes time. There's no way to, um, skip that process. Uh, cause you know, it's sort of like, you know, if you're creating a, you know, you're trying to create yourself being a superhuman person from a workout perspective, you know, you can't skip certain elements of your training plan and not have that exposure at some point. And the same thing happens with trading. Like if you skip the risk management element of it, you know, again, you can probably get away with that a bit during up markets, but when you get volatile and sideways down, it, it will come back and crush you at some point. You'll give up a whole bunch of profits because of not paying attention to, you know, the wholeness that is a, what it takes to be a trader and it takes to be, um, you know, whatever your per, you know, preferred methodology is. Something we were talking about off, you know, off the offline here was trading personality, Logan, you know, and, you know, I think that one of the best things you can do as somebody who is trading or investing is to figure out, you know, what kind of temperament and personality you have towards it. And, you know, there are some people who are amazing at the very short term, fast, you know, quick intraday style trading. And there are people who that is the worst type of trading for them, you know, like where they emotionally, you know, one way or another are just not, you know, built to be able to manage and deal with that kind of wildness. Um, you know, and there's people who, who, who are going to excel at more of swing trading styles or excel more at put credit spread styles or excel more at, you know, stocks versus options, um, you know, or futures over options, whatever the case might be, like, Figuring out what that fits your personality will be a huge benefit to uh, managing your emotional side, uh, which is, you know, that's the beast that makes the dumbest mistakes for everybody who trades is the emotional element of it. It just, just is like, you know, your emotions can make you do some of the dumbest things in trading uh, that when you look back, you're like, why on earth did I sell that or why on earth did I buy that? There literally was no reason. I just emotionally had to get into this thing. And now I'm just giving you, gave away 50, you know, a hundred bucks, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, whatever it might be, $10,000 doing that. So, you know, I got a question for you, Logan. Then. You know, you look at your own self in trading and you've had time now to continue to, you know, you are probably more experienced than most people at trading at this point. You know, if you were to zoom in and say, you know, I feel the most comfortable doing X, what type of trading for you do you think is your, or what type of vehicle or what type of 
instrument do you think is you know where you feel the most comfortable where you have your emotions are the most out of it in the uh in the trading realm is there anything that comes to mind immediately when i say that yeah definitely i would def definitely just trading spx and mainly put credit spreads on it or really anything that's risk defined so like call debit spreads are pretty cool too any sort of risk defined trade on the s p 500 because you're just so like it's predictable. Like it's way more predictable than trying to figure out what these growth tech stocks are going to do, or if Tesla's going to go up a hundred points or down, or you just don't have to deal with all like the, you only have to deal with broad market news. You don't have to deal with like, oh, the CEO is leaving and then the stock drops 5%. So like for me to be emotionally disconnected, and especially when you're like playing within the expected moves or trading around the expected moves is the proper term there that's what makes me more comfortable is just knowing like the s&p 500 super technical based where there's a lot of other stocks that we've seen that just become super irrational and whether that's a 50 percent sell-off after earnings um, where the s&p it's not like we're going to see an 80 percent reduction in the s&p 500 over over a four-month period like arc or a six-month period or whatever right sure so that's kind of the nice thing about trading the S&P 500 is just that diversification. And then I just know all the ins and outs of managing put credit spreads to where like you can roll them, the multiple ways to do that, you know, flipping bearish reasons why you should. And just using the broad market is just so much easier for me to trade. And then just gives you a just better understanding of why you're doing what you're doing. And like you've said multiple times, it's not how you, it's not how you make money. It's if you're making money. So it's like, there's really no benefit to making it harder on yourself. If the whole goal is to make money at the end of the day, you know, just trade the S and P 500 and there's the tax benefits on SPX. And I think that's really what draws me towards it is it's just so technically sound versus everything else. Like the volatility, you know, it's, it's still there, but it's nothing like seeing a stock. All right. Well, the S and P, you know, I don't ever hear me say the S and P 500 is up 9% today. And then it's down <laughs> over the next, yeah. Time. You know, it's like, that's yeah, you don't see that happen. That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, Arc, Arc, yeah. Arc literally had like a 7% day, I think, the other week, which is crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's there's something to be said about simplifying, you know, what you do. Uh, again, some of the best traders I know on the planet, they only trade a couple things. That's it. They just trade like SPX and a couple of big stocks and they just know the personality in and out. Um, you know, there's definitely something to be said about that. You know, there's, um, you know, again, but at the end of the day, it's about honing your, your skill that we're doing here. And it's, you know, there is no, there is no shortcut to becoming um, really good at doing this. There just, there just isn't. It requires a lot of planning, uh, a lot of hard work, and a lot of time spent in front of the screen, reviewing thousands of charts to understand what your patterns, your setups, um, the probabilities are. You know, if you're doing mostly option related side, you know, looking at how all of those different factors that change the option chains, how they how they relate to each other. What is theta doing? What is vega doing? What is delta doing? To me? What's my gamma risk? All those different things that come into mind there. Um, you know, and if you don't know those. Again, at some point, that will expose you when you get into a trade that has one of those com combinations uh, significantly at your risk, and you'd have no idea. It's a complete blindside to you. Um, and that just takes time with spending the right amount of time building up your, your trading muscles, so to speak. You know, I think taking a trade, getting long on a trade is the easiest thing to do. It is really the management of profit, management of risk is where it defines the difference between being long-term successful, you know, or not. And, you know, again, again I think it's, uh, and too many people just focus on the long setups. They look on the, on the setups, for getting, getting in, whatever that might be for them. And they very rarely focus on the, the management, you know, a profit or the management risk inside of that, which is, you know, again, that's, that's a part, it's one of the, it's one of the key points in trading in general is, not about how you know how long how much you can get in. It's about how much you keep in that process and knowing what your repeatable process is over and over again, and not letting the emotions drive when you take something. Because we all been guilty of it, you know, absolutely all been guilty, you know, guilty of that. Is 
you know, you'll like see intraday in the morning, like first 15, 20 minutes a position you're in. That's been, they say it's up 20%. You, you bought it a week ago or whatever. And you're like, you know, I don't want to give this prop back there. There's no reason to actually sell currently, but then you have, it has a quick little 5% drop and you dump, you dump it out. And then immediately you're like the last person to sell it at the low and it rockets back up and it goes up another 20% over the next couple of days. Like, you know, you didn't, your risk management wasn't defined your, you know, your stop loss reasons weren't defined and thus your emotions got to define it. And most people's emotions, you know, they're going to be in like the, the fight or flight mode in the midst of that craziness that's happening. It's really hard to make a completely unemotional decision if you didn't already ahead of time say, okay, well, the stop is this. I trail it above the 10, you know, or at the 20 moving day, whatever the case might be. And that's the only reason I get stopped out is if it closes below that or if it, you know, I move it up after to break even after day five in the trade or whatever it might be. Um, and if you don't have that stuff set up, it, again, your emotions will shake you out of positions for the stupidest reasons when you look back and check it. So, yeah, man, I think that's, uh, if we just recap quick, you know, S and P is, it's hanging on by a thread in my opinion, um, yeah. with, we break below these levels. I have about 43, 43, 12, 54 pin. I don't think that literally that precise, but around that 43, 15 ish range, 43 hundred range, I think it is, it's got a hold in there. And if we don't, I think we're going back to January lows and probably push below that is my guess for a hot second there. Um, I think again, the reality is if we can get one big push down, that will be set us up for the next couple of years of decent run, a decent market run back up. Um, you know, it's again, we're way overdue for a real big correction. It hasn't happened in so many years. I can't even remember the last time. It feels like it's been forever since we've had an environment like that. Um, but again, it creates lots of amazing opportunities on the other end. So, yeah, VIX is up. Looks like it wants to keep climbing. Um, you know, like I said, be smart. Take your time during this environment to learn and watch. Take lots of screen captures, you know, position setups you're looking at so you can reevaluate them, you know, later on. I mean, I literally have an installed plat uh, system in here that I can just quickly click and take screen capture and annotate and drop them into a file. So it's, and I just have it as a, you know, review this back at the end of the month to see, you know, these different patterns I'm seeing that are showing up. You know, uh, are they playing out the way I'm anticipating them to? And it's easy to take a snapshot, drop it in, and look at it again at the end of the month and say, okay, how did this play out? My expectation was going to go down. Did it go down? You know, what happened with it? So there you go, man. Awesome. That's what I got for you today. Well, I appreciate you coming back on, man. Uh, we'll definitely have you back on soon. And, uh, you know, like I said, a weekly basis would be pretty cool to kind of get through this volatility and just do a, a nice little overview. But I'm really curious to see where we head throughout this week, but I do appreciate you coming back on, man. Uh, it means a lot. And if you guys have yet to leave a like on the video, a comment yet, or subscribe, do that now. And also check out the Discord if you guys want to come hang out and kind of see how we're maneuvering the volatility a little bit. Um, you know, I know Halcyon hasn't been doing as many options lately, like we've mentioned. It's been more on the stock side, uh, but I'm still playing a couple small contracts here and there. And it's definitely challenging. It's definitely been a very challenging period, but you know, I'm keeping my uh, head up through all of it. And it's just about moving forward and finding the setups when they come and hopefully we can start basing. So that's going to be everything for me. I appreciate you coming back on, man. And we will see you guys in the next one.